Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Robin Farman Farmayan, entrepreneur, innovator, professional speaker, and author, Robin Farman Farmayan seeks to utilize and apply technology in order to empower patients and consumers. I am so thrilled to have you here, Robin. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know things are crazy with the conference and your speaking and whatnot, but I do appreciate you spending a few minutes with us so we can get to know you better and, and your life and what you do and how you're impacting the world and the future of, of medicine and technology and, and whatnot. So thank you. Sure, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So what will you be speaking about tomorrow when you take the stage? Tomorrow I'm doing about an hour long keynote on patient empowerment through the convergence of accelerating technology. And what that means is really how all these different technologies from you know, sensors, point of care diagnostics on wearable tech combined with 3D printing, artificial intelligence, robotics, being able to utilize the power of the crowd through networks and computing systems, how that's all working together to not only dramatically change medicine over the next two, five, and 10 years, but really put the patient into the driver's seat. And what from your background brought you to where you are today? So at the age of 16, I was misdiagnosed with an autoimmune disease. At by 19, they had taken out my entire large intestine. Oh my goodness. All told, I've had 43 hospitalizations, six major surgeries, and three organs removed. Turns out at the age of 26, after, um, this is seven years after they'd taken out my entire large intestine, my doctors were telling me I was cured because that was a cure for that particular disease, which I did not have. So they took me off all of my medication except high dose opiates. So eventually they kept upping and upping my dose until I was on 80 milligrams a day of methadone, which is a gigantic dose of opiates. Essentially, uh, it, it ruins your life, right? I mean, I could not function, I couldn't work, I could barely go to the grocery store. So I went back to my doctors and I said, okay, I need to off this drug now. It's causing rebound pain, it's horrible, horrible medication, I hate methadone. They said, okay, well, next step would be to surgically implant a morphine pump into your spine. I was like, are you kidding me? I was 26 years old at the time. I was a shut-in, I couldn't do anything. And I was like, absolutely not, that is not the rest of my life. So I fired my healthcare team, took control of my healthcare, ended up getting diagnosed correctly, off all the opiates, by the way, and uh, put on a medication called Remicade. And literally within 24 hours of the first IV dose, I went into remission. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Did you ever inform your doctors that you had seen over the years about your misdiagnosis? And I actually did not go back to any of them. For me, everything is always about living in the moment and looking forward. And so to look back at all the different doctors that misdiagnosed me or you know, have gone through so many patients, IBD, IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease, it's a very difficult disease to diagnose, and diagnostics in general are hard. So first and foremost, I don't want them to feel horrible about doing their best at a time in my life when they didn't have the tools and the technology. You know, this was quite a while ago, back when I was a teenager. Don't do the math. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just didn't want to look back and go back to everyone and say, well, this is how it turned out. Right. So you utilized that experience and those years to empower you to share your journey and change the trajectory of other people's lives as well. So exactly. can you share a little bit about what you're doing? Sure, so because of all of my experiences and I think about the fact that millions of dollars have been spent already to keep me alive, whether it's hospitalizations, um, operating rooms, my Remicade medication alone, I get it every six weeks. And uh, when I get it in the hospital, it's $28,000. When I get it at home, it's $10,000 billed to my insurance company. So I think about, okay, how can I make that worth it? And so I now only specialize in companies that are poised to impact 100 million patients worldwide, and that is my actual life goal. So anything that I choose to work on actually has to meet or even exceed those metrics. So right now I'm vice president of two companies. One is Actavalon, curing cancer by repairing the P53 part of the human cell. When successful, we could cure or treat more than 50% of all cancer. Um, the other company, I'm an investor and vice president of Invicta Medical. Uh, that is a teal funded company and that is sleep apnea using a very disruptive in the mouth platform device. 
a completely different way of looking at sleep apnea than the CPAP. And again, that's 100 million patients worldwide, $11 billion market. And I've made a bunch of investments this year. I'm a strategic angel investor. How so did it, how, let's, <laughs> let's rewind the tape sure. a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about how all of that started. How, oh, how I ended up getting into all that. Yeah. So back in 2005, actually, so 2005 was when I started feeling good enough and I had my confidence back. I'm like, I'm going to finally go out there and work in the real world, right? Before I was doing a lot of volunteer work, I was on a lot of boards in San Francisco, like the opera and the ballet and things like that. It's like, okay, now I wanna make an impact. And I ended up getting a job at the very first consumer-facing genetic sequencing company. What was your background educationally? Uh, so I have a BS in management and finance, and then I hacked my entire education. Because I have a very strong, I went to boarding school in, the, in New England, so very strong foundation. So by the time I got to college, I was like, I, I can be self-hacking, right? And I was very sick too. So I went to Boston University just to get an undergrad degree while I was having all of my surgeries in Massachusetts. And then I, then I went to Stanford, Harvard, Wellesley, Dartmouth, oh Golden goodness. Gate, USF, Boston University, on, and then in addition to just studying stuff online. And I learned what I needed to learn to go on the trajectory of a career that I created that literally doesn't exist. <laughs> Unbelievable, you are a dynamo. Okay, so then fast forward to today. And fast forward to today. Uh, now I'm working in these different areas and I have my business model where I'm both, you know, I'm vice president of companies, so we're, we, you know, we're working normal salaries there, but then I'm also a professional speaker. And the money I make in the professional speaking world gets invested into deep biotech. Wow. So I just did a vaccine for herpes, which is 3.5 billion people worldwide have herpes of the mouth, which can lead to different neurological problems. So this is a really big deal. We want everyone in the world to take this vaccine. Um, another one I did was an immunotherapy, which of course we all know in the world of oncology, because I'm a big vested interest in cancer. And then the third one I just closed about two weeks ago, uh, inhaled insulin for diabetics. So of course that is a gigantic problem. Okay, do you sleep at night? <laughs> yes, because I work <laughs> in sleep. Okay. I, I, everything, I made sure to just create a, a, a life that is easy to walk through, essentially. So I sleep seven to eight hours a night, every single night. I'm very strict about my sleep. I go to bed and wake up at the same time. I work out an hour a day, every single day, 365 days a year, no matter how sick I am. I um, eat regularly, like I make sure to take care of all of those things because it's really the foundation of health. And being a severe chronic disease patient, if I don't watch my hydration and sleep and food intake and just stress levels and just the amount of activity I do, I've had seizures before from things like that. I could get into a severe Crohn's attack and be out of commission. So it's really important for me to manage all of that which means I now outsource everything. I do not go to grocery stores. I do not do any shopping or go into like post offices or Walgreens or anything where you don't, if, if you can outsource it, right. why are you spending your time doing that? So that's my entire mentality of looking at how to live my life. So other than from your own personal experience and journey, where else do you derive your inspiration from? Because it, it is oozing out of every poor. I mean, it is, it's really infectious, uh, for lack of a better word, I guess. Um, so it's just, I find it, you know, remarkable to sit here and listen to your journey and um, everything that you're involved in. It's very exciting. Thank so, you. But where do you derive your inspiration from? Well, first of all, I have a very strong family. Um, we lost my mom nine years ago to cancer, but my, um, my, I was very close with my mom and I'm incredibly close with my father, my sister-in-law, my brother, and my nine-year-old nephew and they are just amazing people. And I can't believe I was blessed with this family who doesn't fight with each other and just wants to be with each other and loves each other and is supportive. And so fortunately, I have that in the background and that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from. But I'm also just an incredibly optimistic person. It's just my personality, it's my dad's personality. I mean, I think this is a genetic thing. And so I look at what people would think is a problem, like um, you get cancer or you get Crohn's disease you um, get into a car accident, your car is totaled, you get fired from your job, you get a divorce, right? You lose a parent. I take that situation and I always flip it over and I say, okay, what can I make of this? 
What, how can I make that not a tragedy, but yet something that will catalyze or, or create something good? And so every single scenario, if that's happened to me, I've turned it into something good. Lost my mom to cancer, I'm now working in curing cancer, and I'm investing in immunotherapy. I have Crohn's disease, right? Instead of being a shut-in, and, and doctors look at me now and they're like, I can't believe you are this medical record, right? I use that instead to create an entire career that will help literally 100 million patients. I mean, that's my goal. So just look at every situation you possibly can from the opposite side, from the optimistic point of view and the opportunity point of view. And that's how I live my life. And on a daily basis in regard to the two companies that you sit as vice president of, what, what's your daily involvement with those companies? So I've created this career that scales and leverages my particular skill set. So I'm the money girl. I, anything to do with revenue, so whether it's investing or it's uh, strategic partnerships, distribution, reimbursement, any of those kinds of things, anything that can tie money coming into a in uh, business, that's my job, right? And so I do the very high level business development for them, which means if I go into an investor's office, I don't have to talk about just sleep apnea. I can talk to the same exact investors because they, they know the kind of companies that I invest in. They know the kind of companies I work for. I have a relationship with them, so I say, okay, here are the three companies I just invested in. Here are the two companies I'm working on. Any of these interest you? I don't say it that way, but you know, I mean, essentially <laughs> right. one meeting, I right. could talk about five different companies that could potentially literally mean millions of dollars, right? And each individual one adds more credibility. So if you're working for a startup company, especially in the world of business development and what I do, um, and they're stealth, what are you gonna sell? You can't get out there on, on, on stage and say, Invicta Medical, and, and give like all the secrets away. I mean, we're still stealth. We're a couple years from FDA approval, right? So instead, I leverage that by doing the other investments, working on other companies, advising, and being the professional speaker so that I have ways to get into all of those doors. And then once I'm in the door of, you know, whether it's the C-suite of an insurance company or a venture capitalist, then I can talk to them about lots of different people. Now let's talk about your message to the patients out there. Yes. So you have a book. Yes. Okay, can you talk about that? It's called The Patient as CEO, and it really does break down these different technologies for patients. I made sure to write the book um, in a way that it's not for specifically for medical professionals or technologists. Like, you don't actually have to be working in those industries to fully understand everything. So I really simplify it. And it's fantastic, especially even for doctors, because doctors are very siloed. So a lot of doctors will read it and be like, wow, it gave a really fast, easy to understand overview of what's happening in medicine over the next five years. And the big thing about being a patient as CEO, people start to think, oh, then it's just me and I'm, I'm just, no, 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 no. Because if you're the CEO of a corporation, there's never just one person. You have a huge team. You have people who are experts in marketing, engineering, finance, organizational management, right, legal. You hire those experts. They report to you and together as a team, you decide how the company should do things, right? So I say, why not bring that model into healthcare and to patients? And the patient can be the CEO in the middle where they have a really good view of their lives and what they want to achieve and accomplish, right? But then they hire the best experts to tell them how to do that, whether that's an orthopedist, a chiropractor, um, an oncologist, a nurse practitioner, uh, acupuncturist, whatever they want, whoever they want on their team, whatever they want on their team, they can make that happen and then they're the one who coordinates. And if the coordination is a little bit difficult, because I understand being a very severe chronic disease patient, I understand when you are not feeling well, it's hard to make decisions. And it's hard to do the research for yourself. So that's why we have COOs of the healthcare team. And that can be done by either artificial intelligence, health coaches or, or life coaches that are either remote, so it could be done virtually, or you could have someone who's a caretaker in your home who is helping you as that COO role. But just remember, in the end, you are not the victim anymore. This is no longer a victim God scenario. This is now a scenario where you, as the patient, are the one who is in control. And how, what would you say to a patient who, is, who feels that way and wants to do that, but they are dealing with the struggles of providers? Oh, you mean like who's gonna pay, how do they get it paid, they get for, it paid for and all of that and kind of stuff. And the financial situation that surrounds yes. hiring that COO and all of the people that work on that team. Absolutely, so your insurance, whoever is insuring you, so I'm assuming they have some type of insurance, they help you with that. 
So you can just call up United or Humana or any of them, and they will literally walk you through it. So i would be like, okay, you know what? I need a new um, dermatologist, right? And I want to be out of the system that I've been in, so what are my options? And they will literally stay on the phone with you for hours going over your options. They will walk you through the websites. And I've done this now with two of the big major insurance companies. They are really helpful with that. Use them as a resource. Now, many of the physicians that are part of A4M and uh, the organization that, um, that uh, we represent here, they are now outside of that provider community, and they have you know, taken back healthcare the way they want to practice it, and going to the root cause of a problem, and treating patients you know, for w far more than 15 minutes at a time, you know, and, and really getting to know that patient and the issues that are surrounding that patient, and getting to why they're having the symptoms that they have. For a patient who is frightened, who really would like to go to see that type of practitioner, how would you recommend that that patient gets past the, uh, but I can't afford to go out of pocket because my insurance won't cover that. So what would, you, what would your message be for that? So if they patient? really, that's, that's the thing that's, that's, break, that's stopping them from going down the path that they think they would help them, then they need to do a financial analysis. This is a risk analysis. There are numbers and metrics you can assign to this. This is how much it costs. This is how, how much it would cost you to do uh, something else, right? So you can do that cost value analysis but you can also look at the opportunity cost. So if I don't do this and I continue to be too sick to have a full-time job, how much money is that gonna cost right. me this year? Right, $60,000. How much is that dollars. diagnostic test that I have to go out for my deductible going to cost me, which exactly. they might not need in the first place? Exactly, right. and you might have a $5,000 deductible. Right. So there are a lot of numbers where, in fact, out-of-pocket may not actually be more expensive or it might not be as expensive as you think. To give you an idea of that, uh, with, uh, with a total colectomy and Crohn's disease, which means I get extremely dehydrated very quickly. I mean, it takes me less than 24 hours before I'm in the emergency room getting IV um, saline solution. Now, the only solution for patients like me up until now was the emergency room. You couldn't just walk into an infusion clinic. You have to go to an actual emergency room. And even a normal walk-in clinic doesn't usually have IVs. So think about a patient like me, all I need is hydration, and I just spent not only the amount of money that it costs a patient in a deductible to go through an emergency room is ridiculously expensive, but in addition, the, the hospital, the cost of per patient in a hospital in the ER is huge. Instead, there's a company called IVDoc now, and that is direct to consumer IVs. So just like the Uber app, I open up the app, I, I order a nurse practitioner on demand who is in my house within an hour or two, and I can do one to two liters saline solution, I can order IV vitamins and all of that. And we're talking for the, for the one liter of saline that keep, prevents me from having to go to the ER, cost me $220 out of pocket. Unbelievable. So uh, I ask you, look at the cost value analysis and then also look at the fact, okay, if I'm not in the ER as immunocompromised patient, I am not subjecting myself to infectious disease. It is really, bad place to be if you are a patient is the ER, right? Because you potentially could catch something which would make your life significantly worse, including things like MRSA, right? So take that into consideration when you are choosing to do things out of pocket. Wow. So what do you consider to be some of the most promising and potentially life-changing technological developments and advancements coming down that you had the opportunity to, to see? So many, so many. Okay, so probably... Well, artificial intelligence is one of the biggest ones, and AI is what drives virtual reality. And virtual reality in medicine is exploding, right? So those two things, um, and the AI part is not just applied directly to patients, but drug discovery and drug repurposing. I mean, it's impacting every area of medicine, from diagnostics to replacing pathologists. Like, there's a company called 3Scan that can do in one day what it would take a traditional pathologist a year. A year, and that's just one of the technologies. The other one that beyond VR and AI is sensor technology. Sensors are getting smaller, faster, better, cheaper, and they are going on everything. So that's enabling things like continuous monitoring of glucose levels or what have you, which is a big deal. In addition, it's enabling point of care diagnostics, which means you can move the patient out of the hospital and the clinic significantly more times. And you can have these point of care diagnostics at home, and a lot of them cost 
between $99 and $300 out of pocket. So you can have your own stethoscope, ear monitor. You can even do a subscription model now for ultrasounds, where you can have a $300 a month ultrasound that plugs into your smartphone. So I think those are three of the <laughs> biggest ones, but wow, I mean, I could go for hours talking about 3D printing or being able to utilize networks and the power of the cloud itself for things like research around genomics and the microbiome. So there's a lot. <laughs> so what does it mean to you to be speaking at an event like this where you have you know, a few thousand like-minded physicians who um, are hoping to utilize the technologies that are coming down. It is so inspirational and so much fun. These are my favorite types of events because the people here are here because they want to learn and they want to be able to integrate and execute on these new innovations more easily and, and more accessibly, right? So I love it because it's very inspirational. They, they really appreciate the information. You are very inspirational. I, I'm in awe of you, I have to tell you. Um, but I can't imagine being a chronic disease patient that you have, um, you know, and you have, I'm sure, I don't, I don't, we don't need to get into the specifics, but with the amount of traveling that you do for your career and your speaking engagements, how do you manage not getting sick when you're flying internationally, especially? Strangely enough, I, I've had now over 100 bookings in 12 countries, and I've only had a minor cold in Germany one time. So uh, it's really prevention, prevention, prevention. I am immunocompromised, I live on planes. You would think that I would be constantly sick and I'm just not. And so it's a mindset, it's that hacker mindset. So for instance, um, I got on the plane today, I mean yesterday, I have sanitizing wipes and I have hand sanitizer which I use continuously whenever I am traveling, anytime I touch anything. Um, I make sure at the, at the airport I don't even have to give them ID, I use the iris scan. I, when I got here, I had Instacart meet me half an hour afterwards with all of my favorite and easy to eat food. So I have them in my hotel room. I had the hotel bring up an extra refrigerator for me for free, by the way, for all my yogurt and all of that kind of stuff because I'm on a mostly liquid diet. I, it's, when I get to the hotel room, I take those sanitizing wipes and I wipe down the light, fix the light switches and the faucets and things like that. Anywhere I think I'm going to be touching, I will disinfect it and I just make sure to have everything I need. I bring a hot pot with me with, with sugar and um, tea. I bring a heating pad with me. So I make sure to have all the comforts of my own home wherever I'm traveling. So when you were a child, what did you envision yourself doing when you were an adult? Professionally. So when I was growing up until I got sick, I just assumed that I was going to run a multinational conglomerate of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like, I was always incredibly driven. My, uh, my first sentence was, where's the revenue stream? <laughs> and I was pretty much carrying a briefcase by the time I was six. Oh I just goodness. never went through that phase of being a kid. Like I just, I love, I love making a difference and I'm incredibly passionate about it. And my family, was again a big, big um, influence in this because my dad is a MIT chemist turned patent attorney and he does a lot in medicine and biotech. And my mom was a physician and she was one of three women in medical school in 1964, in her entire medical school. I grew up surrounded by medical innovation. And then in addition, my mom did mostly uh, free, free work. So she'd work in like church basements or really poor areas of New Hampshire for little to no money, right? Because just donating her time. And then my dad on the side also was like president of the American Stage Festival and, and on this board and on that board. So I just grew up knowing, A, you help people. B, you go into medicine and biotech because that's the way to change the world. Wow. And C, make sure you're donating a huge amount of your time and money because it just pay it forward. You're unbelievable. So what advice would you give to that seven-year-old girl who has visions of ruling biotech one day? Just keep working hard. And uh, let me tell you, in my career and in my life, I've been knocked down a whole bunch of times because I'm a tiny little petite you know, blonde. And they don't expect you to want to be the one who's ruling the world, right? They want you to be the executive assistant. So just every time someone does that to you, either walk away or smile and just prove them wrong. And that's how I've lived my life. Instead of trying to fight against that, I just do. And now that where I am in my position in my career, I have pulled up as many women as possible. Every single day I try to pull up another woman to where I am. So make sure that even if you're lower than somebody, try and pull them up anyway. Just live your life that way and it will come back to you. So um, you obviously are a mentor to so many. 
Yes. And um, do you have any mentors, both male and female, that you look to for inspiration, guidance, advice? Yes, um, so my best friend, Sylvia, she lives next door. I actually moved down to Palo Alto eight years ago. Um, and I, in part, I chose where I lived because it's literally right next door to her. It's a perfect apartment for me as well. But she is, she pulls me up, right? And I look to her, she runs auctions, multi-billion dollar auctions between countries and companies. So oh she goodness. was the lead and it's her company. She's the founder and CEO that just ran a $19 billion auction for Spectrum. And she is also one of those women that just pulls up as many women as possible. And we call it sending the elevator back down because most of us crawled up the outside of the building using our nails. So now we just send the elevator back down for as many women as possible. And she and I have created this community in Palo Alto and Silicon Valley of, of women who are just out there helping each other. Extraordinary, you really are. Um, so if you weren't doing what you're doing, what do you think you'd be doing? If I weren't doing this exactly? This exactly. Wow, if I weren't trying to cure cancer and sleep apnea and, <laughs> yes. and uh, herpes and things like that, I would, I, I, I can't imagine, like, this is way too much fun. <laughs> I'd be running a company, probably. Right. And what yeah. planet are you from? <laughs> <laughs> oh my Venus. God, yeah. of course, well, <laughs> duh, of course that, but yeah, you're really extraordinary. Well, thank you for everything that you're doing to change the mm -hmm. scope of how women are seen in biotech and in business, as well as what you're doing for the healthcare industry. Well, thank you. We look forward to seeing the fruits of your labor very soon, thank you. hopefully. <laughs>